Schumann. Um, Dr. Schumann received a PhD uh, in 1991 and uh, habilitation in computer science in 2000, actually from TU Munich. Um, so his work uh, was on the automated uh, theory proving and the deduction. And uh, since 1999, he's working at the NASA AMS Research Center in California. Um, he is engaged in research on automated generation of reliable programs uh, for statistical data analysis techniques for verification and validation of uh, advanced uh, and learning software for aircraft and autonomous UAV, as well as um, automatic uh, runtime monitoring and verification. So Dr. Schumann is also of a book on theory improving in software engineering has added a book uh, on application of neural networks in high assurance applications and uh, has published um, numerous articles on automated deduction, automatic program generation, safety critical systems and the neural network oriented topics. So as you can see from his uh, biography, this has actually very strong tied also to the um, focus topic of our future lab uh, when it comes to um, reasoning and the uncertainty uh, for AI systems. Uh, of course, we have a slightly different application focus, uh, which is more on earth persuasion, but I do believe we can learn quite a lot uh, from Dr. Schumann's um, experience. So now, uh, Dr. Schumann, um, the floor is yours. We are very much looking forward to your talk. Dr. Schumann, please unmute your telephone, your microphone. I'm sorry. Great. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, thank you very much for the invitation and the kind introduction. So I'm talking about uh, artificial neural networks and AI in high assurance applications. So artificial neural networks, they actually have been around for a long time. So I remember when I bought my first book on neural networks, I think it was around 87, 88. It came with a floppy drive, five and a quarter inch floppy drive with the software on it. So this was the first generation. And then roughly in the mid 2000s with the advent of graphical processing units and convolutional deep neural networks, the applications for neural networks multiplied uh, literally. So now you find deep neural networks in automotive aircraft, medical devices, process control, natural language processing, games, social media, pretty much many, many uh, applications. And even more recently, which gives another boost uh, to uh, neural networks is the development of neuromorphic chips, which uh, can execute uh, neural networks extremely fast, extremely power saving. So you can have a big neural network running on your smartphone or running on a small uh, <clears throat> embedded device. So there's a lot of applications, mainly nowadays uh, vision processing, uh, image uh, understanding, natural language uh, processing, and also uh, other things like uh, conversational things, playing games, and such kind of applications. DNNs are often used synonymously with artificial intelligence. I'm also doing it here. Uh, I think for the purpose of this talk, most of the things I say for deep neural networks can also be uh, carried over to other AI or styles of AI systems like rule-based systems, knowledge-based systems, things like that. And the topic of this talk today is how about safety, certification, and ethics. So my background is I'm coming from formal methods and computer science. I have been uh, working and still working on looking at how can we make sure that safety critical software working at NASA for space and for uh, aircraft or for air traffic control can be made uh, safe 
so that nothing bad can happen. And also a big topic in this area is certification of software. And this third topic I will briefly touch is the ethics of using these kind of things or how can we deal with those. So let's start in the middle. What is a neural network? Everybody knows our neural network, deep neural network. So a lot of people say different things like, oh yeah, it's an artificial brain in the computer. Coolest things like sliced bread. Other people, especially from the software form of method say, oh, that's a nasty non-deterministic piece of software. Or they say, oh, it's a high dimensional lookup table. Numeric quadratic optimization algorithm or a Kalman filter for estimating function parameters and gains. And the interesting thing is, well, it's none of the above or it's all of the above. So I actually heard all of these uh, notions. And in my experience, I worked on a project a couple of years ago on verification and validation of a neural network which was sitting on an aircraft and trying to control the aircraft in case the aircraft is damaged. We did test flights on a manned aircraft. So pretty much if everything, if anything goes wrong, then uh, the pilot is in big trouble. So it was very important to really kind of focus how you talk about a neural network to what people expect. And so if you want to get money, you might say, oh, it's artificial brain, and then have a brain in inside uh, a box or something like that. If you talk to a controls engineer or a computer science person, you probably better talk about a numeric quadratic optimization algorithm. So it's very uh, diverse on how working on a, of a neural network or in general an AI system is perceived. And so we need to dig deeper to really pinpoint what needs to be done to make this system safe. So artificial neural network, I'm not talking about in much detail. It's pretty much, I see it as an abstract mathematical abstraction of the neurons and synapses uh, found in uh, the biological brains. More theoretically, it's a structure that can approximate high dimensional functions. The uh, usually neural networks in the middle uh, panel or the bottom panel is you have layers of neurons connected by uh, by weights. Here in the middle, you have a three layer, one input layer, one hidden layer, and one output layer. The connection is done using weighted sums. So you multiply the inputs by each input by a weight and add them up. And uh, this is the output, including some usually nonlinear activation function. The big thing for these neural networks to work is that you can automatically estimate the weight parameters using iterative optimization and machine learning algorithms. So this is the kind of minimal neural network architecture. Nowadays, deep neural networks contain multiple layers of uh, neurons like this architecture here and these architectures are usually uh, suited and used for image processing and image understanding. So pretty much when uh, analysis of, uh, let's say, earth science data, then these deep structures will be uh, the uh, thing of choice. So <clears throat> now when we look at safety, we can distinguish between two kinds of artificial intelligence. So one is the analytical AI. This analyzes the data and pretty much presents the results to the humans. So just you can find the examples face or speed recognition, stock market prediction, or the famous thing you point the camera somewhere and the neural network says, oh yeah, here's a cat mm. or here's a dog. And uh, I also would, uh, 
pretty much this is also one important thing. You take lots of data, often visual data, high, uh, uh, hyperspectral data, time series data. You give it to the AI or neural network and you get uh, results and the human is looking at the results uh, and then making some decisions. On the other hand, you have the what's called operational artificial intelligence. This kind of AI analyzes the data and controls the system. So this is typically the situation for self-driving cars, self uh, unmanned drones, intelligence weapons. So there's a lot of applications also there. And obviously, a self-driving car or the neural network and the AI in the self-driving car is safety critical because if this thing fails, uh, it can endanger a human <clears throat> life. So if we take this uh, definition of safety critical, that pretty much it can endanger a human life as the definition, then we have to ask, looking at analytical AI, can this kind of AI also be safety critical? And in my opinion, I, we have to say yes. Just let's look at some AI system, which let's say analyzes satellite data and uh, finds out about, uh, let's say, a watering schedule for some uh, crops in, in a country. So mm -hmm. if the decision maker is looking at the results of the AI system, it has been trained. So it tells uh, the, the decision maker, okay, you need to do this watering schedule to get optimal plant growth. But what happens if the AI is wrong, the plants <clears throat> may not grow. So there might be uh, famine and uh, loss of life. So it's definitely safety critical. And uh, this is, I think, important point that we really have to look at all that we make for all applications of AI sure that it's working as expected. But unfortunately, this is not that uh, trivial. And so let's look at the typical verification and validation. I start a little bit from the kind of software point of view. Uh, to, to seek to, to show kind of what's done for traditional uh, safety critical software. So safety critical software must undergo what's called verification and validation. These two tasks are verification where we ask ourselves, are we building the system right? So is the system actually <clears throat> built in the proper way uh, or uh, we introducing some errors when we, let's say, do the low level implementation or when we do the uh, design of the system. And the validation is, are we building the right system? So we have built a system. Now we have to validate, is this a system we actually want? Or did we build something else? So this is validation. Uh, often validation is uh, pretty much used synonymously with testing. Verification and validation of safety critical software is extremely complicated and very costly. So in development of aircraft, commercial aircraft, the verification validation is one of the big cost drivers of a, the development of an aircraft. And in these domains, uh, aircraft also uh, thing, uh, application areas like uh, nuclear, uh, power plants, this software also must be certified against a certain standard. So pretty much there is standards out there for aircraft, there are standards out there for automotive, there are standards out there. And the developer of the software needs to follow these standards, which means they need to follow step by step um, <clears throat> what kind of activities need to be done and need to be demonstrated to uh, to show that the software that we have developed is actually doing the right thing. However, there's a big 
issue is when we look at deep neural networks and artificial intelligence, pretty much what can be done for V and V of DNNs and AI. This is still very much in its infancy, and but it's a really active uh, research topic. So now let's look at how can we use experience from V and V of software and carry this over to V and V of neural networks. So when we do the traditional software, uh, there's one very famous uh, diagram, uh, originally coming from uh, Barry Beam. Uh, you pretty much when you develop software, you have several stages. You start with the requirements, you, you design the, the software, then you implement the software and you test the software. So you pretty much you go down the left uh, arc of the V, coming up with the uh, so produce software, and then you do a lot of testing here. First unit testing, testing the small things, and then integration testing and testing until you get to test the entire thing. I was talking about verification and validation. So validation or testing is going from here over to here. So does my system actually meet the requirements? Whereas verification is, okay, I have requirements and I made a design. Is this design actually uh, consistent with my requirements. So this is how things are done for traditional uh, software. And now let's look at, well, we are not doing traditional software. We are wanting to do data analysis software. Well, it's in some sense similar. The process, you start out with a statistical model on what uh, you want to kind of analyze. And then in the tr traditional way, you kind of do an implementation in MATLAB or uh, R or any other kind of uh, language, you use packages, you use uh, everything. You, so you pretty much come up with some piece of code. And now you need to, to test the code. So you probably will first do a kind of a unit test. Okay, doing whatever the abalone example, is my mixture of Gaussians running okay? So this could be a simple unit test. And then going, uh, doing the testing with reference data and doing calibration of the model. And of course you should also uh, test and validate the writing on the slides. Sorry about the typo. So this is how the uh, verification and validation process going. The user is kind of in the, in the in, uh, developer is in the center of this v &V effort. So the user when implementing the uh, code for the data analysis is actually then having to think about do I'm do, 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 do I, am I doing the right thing to actually implement the code for the correct statistical model. Now let's do how we, how, or let's say how people do things with deep neural networks. So they start out with a cool idea. Oh, well, yeah, I have some data, I have lots of data and I want to find out this one. Oh yeah, and then, uh, well, yeah, let, let's use deep neural networks. So they come up with a deep neural network 12 layers, 256 uh, by 256 uh, tensors, and a certain activation function. Oh yeah, and then you click, uh, the, because you download the, the software, you just press click to train, and the system actually uses the training data to train the neural network. And then often the case is, then you have the trained neural network, you run the trained neural network on your real data and out comes a paper. Unfortunately, a lot of things are done this, this way. I heard about uh, asking a PhD student uh, why he was using a deep neural network to, to train some uh, problem using six different variables and why not a regular network or some other machine learning. 
he said, oh yeah, my supervisor said, uh, you probably should use deep neural networks because everybody is doing that. So this is same for the architecture of the neural network. It's, you have a number of parameters, let, let's say how many layers you have, how many hidden neurons you have, what kind of activation function, a lot of these things. And it's in principle, very difficult to find out what kind of optimal way you have to select your architecture. So people quite often just select the standard architecture. They download the, let's say TensorFlow or PyTorch or whatever uh, software, and they just use the kind of existing, um, existing settings. And also people usually unfortunately don't really look at the training data they have so pretty much quite often the outcome of an experiment using real data on a trained neural network is sometimes real cool things come out sometimes not so but it's very kind of not really trustworthy necessarily so we need to look at obviously this kind of uh, way of doing things is not the right way. And so let's look a little bit deeper. So when I talked about development for, of data analysis uh, systems, so the traditionally the user develops a model. So if you look down here, it can be a statistical model with distributions with all kinds of mathematical things. And then the system with the actual software is produced either by direct implementation or if you have a tool uh you can also generate this code and you calibrate the parameters with uh, test data so what we call in, in the software you have pretty much a white box when you look into the model you actually can see this it might be hard to understand because it's complicated uh, but you can see everything using deep neural networks you start with a set of training data and you don't need a model, you don't need an implementation. And the system is generated by machine learning using the training data and some kind of test data to validate internally how things are. So when you look at the outcoming system, you see this black box here. That's all you see. And if you look into the black box, you see this one. It's literally, a bunch of numbers. These are the weight parameters for the neural networks. And this is pretty much where all the information, what has been learned by the neural network is uh, encoded inside. So when you look from the outside at one of these systems, then the question is, which would you trust more? And how could we do verification and validation? So, uh, as I said, the data, training data is extremely important. And so, uh, just to reiterate, in a traditional model, you have usually name parameters, like it could be hundreds of name parameters, like the growth rate of, of, the, of the wheat or something like that. In contrast to neural networks, where you have the information kept in really this kind of gigantic uh, tables of floating point numbers, usually millions of floating point numbers. And these tables are automatically generated from a large set of training data using complex non-deterministic stochastic optimization algorithms. And if you talk to a person who, who is doing verification validation or certification of safety critical software, the words complex, non-deterministic, stochastic kind of let's in this person uh, light up all the red lights. So one important thing is, and this is one uh, thing which I am uh, proposing is actually for all these processes, you have to consider the data which you use for training as really first class citizen like the software. So in this V shape, we need to add 
additional uh, activities for assurance of the training data quality and coverage, maintenance of training data, because you have a set of training data, could be, let's say, a bunch of uh, satellite imagery, for example, or other time series data. You use this for the uh, for the uh, for the training, but then it's probably lying around somewhere on some uh, lost hard drive. So during the life cycle of the project, you need to should maintain the the training data. You should assure that it's of high quality. You also need to assure the machine learning and also you need to make assurance on the VNV architecture. So pretty much you need to provide arguments. Why am I using 12 layers and not two layers or 16 layers? And these things need to be kind of documented and kept with all the uh, information and artifacts of the project. So just to give a quick overview of the VNV approaches, there's a lot of things out there. I don't want to go into uh, details because I could probably talk about each of those topics uh, for an hour. So one important thing is doing statistical analysis of the training data. You want to see kind of are the training data covering my space? I just recently worked on some uh, training data for some aerospace application and I found out well they only looked at a part of the of the uh, of the of the airport space but not at the, at the other airport in the training data. So obviously if the aircraft is sitting on the other side of the, the airport then you have a pretty much an untrained uh, network for these applications. Another technique very popular these days is called adversarial techniques. It's pretty much developing test cases to trick the deep neural network to deliver the wrong result. So there is uh, the typical example is uh, for let's say an automotive uh, neural network detecting uh, let's say uh, traffic signs. So it should detect a stop sign. So you attach a small sticker to the stop sign and out of a sudden, the stop sign is not detected anymore as a stop sign, which of course is uh, not a good thing. And uh, so there is techniques which really try to come up finding these things and also uh, then trying to improve the neural network so that it cannot be spoofed that much. Then there's a lot of techniques using formal methods and model checking to find out kind of areas where the neural network is behaving weakly. Another thing is using Bayesian runtime techniques, uh, like measuring while the system is running, measuring or having the neural network produce a, a metric on how confident it is about, the, about its prediction. And then extracting rules out of this black box, out of these millions of numbers uh, to extract some rules or graphs or other human digestible uh, information for interpretability and explainability. So these are main V and V approaches. And there are a lot of questions you actually have to uh, demonstrate. So of course, you, one thing you want to have that it's kind of uh, safe. But there is also a lot of other questions which come up with just with AI. Um, for example, how to assure ethical behavior of an operational AI. Just assume a car and uh, using a neural network to decide if it's brakes or so. Then you always have these situations often artificially uh, set up. Uh, there might be a situation where the neural network has to decide, should I kill the, a pedestrian? Should I kill a child? Or should I kill the uh, driver in the car? This is some kind of really still unknown, unsolved issues which need to be 
uh, there need to be research on how this uh, can be uh, formalized, can be uh, safe. Classical thing is the Isaac Asimov's three law of robotics. Don't, um, don't harm a human being and uh, also don't, uh, don't do nothing. Uh, and, but still keep the robot uh, alive. So there's a lot of things which can be done to assure the safety of complex AI driven operations runtime monitoring, there's stuff being done as we speak in uh, for aircraft standardization, human in the loop, a safety person. Then another thing which is very popular at, at NASA, how could an AI work in an unknown environment? So in the case going from Earth observing to Mars observing, so um, you might have a uh, thing, it, it might come up, or you could plant uh, broccoli in, the, in this uh, patch on the, on the Mars. Okay, a president can do that, but an AI shouldn't probably. So another important topic for safety is how to assure AI human interaction and collaboration. So pretty much how can the neural network present the result and also present the result, how it came to the result or what are the reasons that it came up with, okay, I can plant broccoli. And how can a human collab actually collaborate with an AI to let's say improve the answers to do uh, more analysis. And finally, this is more for the operational uh, AI and of course for all the um, science fiction fans, how can we avoid or control or sure kind of emerging behavior? Typically things like Skynet, the Terminator or the Matrix, pretty much AI uh, going haywire and doing bad things on, on its own. So to come to my conclusions, definitely we and we and assurance is important for AI in scientific data analysis, not just AI for driving cars, but also for scientific uh, data analysis and data understanding. There's many approaches uh, for doing the uh, VNV, which are still in its infancy. And there's many questions to be addressed. I talked about the more traditional things regarding safety, kind of what are the right requirements? How can we assure the training data and the neural network performance? One thing which I didn't talk about, but this will become important because it's to expect it that neural networks will find their way to onboard systems. So you want to do training of the neural network on board the satellite. So how can we make sure that this training works uh, perfectly. And even more questions I briefly talked about. Can the black box be converted in such a way that the AI kind of is explaining itself, it's explaining its line of reasoning, how it came to the, uh, to the result connected with that ethical questions. And I think the two last things are very important human AI collaboration and interfaces, both kind of in the, uh, let's say, analytic uh, area where the human needs to interpret uh, the result of the AI of the, or the neural network, and also an interaction between the AI and the neural network or uh, and the human to actually improve the results. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, questions, please. So thank you very much, Dr. Schumann, for the nice presentation. Now I would like to open the floor for a discussion. Please go ahead with your questions. I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, yes. I can. Oh, perfect. Thank you. First of all, great presentation. Thank you very much. 
the first question is about the list of techniques that you presented on one of the slides. I understood this is not really exhaustive because there is many, but I, I think, why don't you list testing? Because testing is still a quite a powerful and useful technique. Any? Uh, definitely, uh, you're, you're totally right. I, I, it's, it's subsumed that under the, under the V and V where the validation is actually the testing. But you're right, testing is definitely one of the most important uh, verification validation activity in this area. Okay, yeah, that, I was just guessing maybe there is yeah, something. Yeah, I should, I should have wrote it out explicitly. Thank you. Okay, and for, for the second question is that the definition of verification and validation, you have a slide with a definition and then this V cycle, famous V cycle. Uh, I know that the definition can be different in different domains like, you know, aerospace, automotive, yeah. they, they, they are not exactly the same. The question here is that you say that the, in your definition, validation is, are we building the right system? Basically, it means that the requirements are good enough. And verification is, are we building the system right? It means that the implementation is, is good. So like the code has no bugs or yeah. hardware is okay. But on the, on the diagram, if you switch to the diagram, it's, it's, I mean, it looks differently because the validation is coming from requirements to the, to the some system testing. To me, it's, it's, it's verification, isn't it? Uh, it's actu actually, uh, you test that your system uh, from that kind of top right here uh, actually meets by, let's say by testing meets the, uh, meets the requirements. Right, right, because in, in the definition that you have, it's like, are we building the yeah. right system, yeah. isn't it? And I, are we, and for, for uh, verification, are we building the system right? Is pretty much looking here at the, let's say at the design. Did I build the design right given the requirements? So I'm going this up. But in general, there is a lot of discussion about what exactly uh, is, is, is what. And there's also numerous uh, kind of different uh, processes uh, out there on how to develop software and how to do uh, the V and V uh, activities to to get uh, most uh, the, the kind of best possible product. Right, right. Yeah, I know that. Let's say even the, in the aerospace, that in the standards, that there can be different definitions. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's it. Okay, so next questions from Pranav. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Johan. Uh, thanks for Hi. the talk. Um, just to be compact, I put my questions in the chat. If you could address a couple of them uh, based on how much time you have, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. So let me just see where I can give up the chat. I can raise for you, uh, Dr. Schumann. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Question number one. How close to the real operation scenario does the training and testing data have to be? Uh, good question. It obviously should be kind of close enough, uh, but you always want the neural network to also uh, generalize. So pretty much you don't want the neural network just to learn my whatever 10 different scenarios and reproduce this exactly. This is the pretty much recall metric, but you also want to uh, have the network uh, perform well in uh, somewhat similar scenarios, but not exactly uh, the, the one on which it has been trained. So this is the generalization. <coughs> Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Next question. Should I use sorry? <clears throat> should I use the same set of data for testing the algorithm as for training, or should I it be a different set of testing data? 
I think the more different set of testing data you have, the better. Using training data as testing data is an absolutely no. But if you use, let's say, the test data, which you used to uh, gauge the, the training, if you use it for, uh, for other purposes, let's say for, for a system test or, or other uh, varieties of test, this is definitely a part of the test. But in general, the more diverse your set of test cases is, the better. And also you need to make sure that your test cases somehow as good as possible cover the entire operational space. So uh, it could be, and, and, and not, not just uh, specific things. So that, that's also one of the important uh, and difficult questions, how to actually uh, do this in practice. Okay, thank you. Next question, how much testing is sufficient? For example, how or when can I be sure that I have completed testing validation of the algorithm? I think there's only one answer which I heard. <laughs> this is the, from some person in industry, testing ends when the money runs out. <laughs> okay. So, and on the other hand, for some of the mass probes, they actually did software testing while the Mars rover already was flying to the Mars. So the more testing you can do, the better. I don't think testing kind of ever ends. Um, there is lots of metrics, different standards talk about different metrics, how, how much is sufficient. Uh, it's one of the most difficult questions. And I think with AI or neural networks, it's even uh, get, getting more complicated. Okay, uh, can I comment on this question a little yeah. bit? Yeah, just because I think this is one of the key problems for AI because the metrics that we have in the traditional industry, they do not apply, let's say the coverage, structural coverage is totally not applicable. And that, that's exactly. one, of the, one of the things. That's exactly in the neural network. You have one test case, and you get a hundred percent code coverage. Right. Uh, yeah, but and also in AI or neural networks, the dimensionality of the of the problem space can be much much higher. So for for an aircraft, you can say, okay, uh, whatever. I have a certain uh, minimum and maximum altitude and a certain minimum and maximum speed. And if I test in this area, then, then I'm done. But if you have a artificial, uh, let's say some, you have might have hundreds of dimensions uh, of space, which you cannot, uh, cannot traditionally cover with, with test cases. So that's my take. Okay, thank you. Another question. Regarding emerging, emerging behavior, how can I avoid building an unintended functionality? Do you have a specific recommendations for modeling specifying a function in a certain way to enable detection of such unintended behavior emerging from the design? Again, a very good question. I don't think there is any good answer yet. At least I don't know of any. I think runtime monitoring, pretty much kind of having some traditionally developed uh, monitors look at, uh, at the system and see if the system kind of is behaving with its limits. Uh, this is definitely one step in the right direction, but there might be so many other possibilities. Uh, I think there's still a lot of research needed. Thank you. Thank you very much for the answers. And thank you for posing the questions, Mr. Espinosa. OK, thanks. Thank you. So more questions? Any questions from the audience? Uh, uh, yeah, hi. I, I would, oh. Oh, okay, OK, go ahead, David, please. <laughs> ah, OK, thanks. Uh, yeah. Hi, yes, David, also from the Institute of Flight System Dynamics. Hi, Johan. Um, I have just one question. Like, you showed one slide where you compared like the traditional approaches with the deep neural networks. 
Um, and there kind of you, you stated that um, like no implementation um, is necessary for neural networks. And um, I was wondering, like, I mean, it depends also somehow how you implement your neural network, right? Because you need to uh, choose the number of layers, number of weights and so on. So isn't then there also somehow like a implementation necessary? Uh, yeah, I kind of on purpose, uh... And I also quoted this, no implementation necessary. Thank yes, you. you're definitely right. There is a number of parameters you need to, need to set. However, I found it in many, many cases that people just use the default settings they get with the software. Okay. Because, so, because they yeah. don't, usually people don't understand the, the intricacies of, of the data. And then they... Obviously, kind of, I would do the same kind of start with the default parameters, and uh, but then one would need to analyze: is this setting of the of the uh, parameters a good setting, or do I need a different architecture? Okay, yeah, okay, thanks. So, wouldn't it make sense, like, to have kind of a dependency on your training data to the number of layers uh, and so on? Uh, yes, de yeah. de def definitely there. There is work out there that uh, pretty much trying to optimize uh, the the architecture of the of the neural network. Okay, thanks. And, but yeah. uh, but the, that's a very kind of computational intensive thing because you need to pretty much do the training over and over again. But there is work out there, and there is also some techniques in Bayesian statistics uh, can actually help to. Uh, help to answer these these questions. Okay, thanks, thanks, thank you very much, Johan. Thank you. So next, uh, Constantin, would you like to ask something? Oh no, I'm good, thank you. Okay. So next <laughs> questions. Um, yes, it's uh, Hannes here, also from um, FSD. Uh, hi, Johan. Uh, hi. Um, so you in your in your in your um, presentation, you also mentioned um, this uh, tool for the online generation of a confidence measure, um, especially for this um, aircraft control application. Yeah. And um, my question there is, um, if you want to use this online monitoring um, to decide basically on um, reconfiguring your control, control strategy to some backup controller, um, in terms of yeah, how much confidence or how much trust you can give to your um, neural network controller. Um, is there a way or is there an approach or would you say what is the correct approach to define basically the requirements of this for this threshold in your confidence measure? Um, when can I trust it? When can I not trust it anymore? That's a very good question. I don't think uh, the this is a uh, easy question uh, to, 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 to answer uh, because it uh, very much de de also depends on the robustness of the controller and robustness of the, of the system. So finding this kind of threshold, uh, I think is in general, not sure if this is possible at all. Uh, and I also would uh, say it's very difficult. Um, uh, I think it, it needs to done uh, needs to be done with um, with uh, kind of in some sense trial and error and some some testing. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any question from the audience? So uh, please, uh, Professor uh, Richard Bambler, will give some concluding remarks. Yes, yes. Uh, so um, Dr. Schumann, thank you very much for this inspiring uh, presentation. It confirmed uh, also many of our concerns uh, how machine learning and, um, and deep learning is sometimes sloppily done currently to produce papers. I like this slide uh, very much. The output is a paper. The output is not science or an engineering result. The output is a paper. This is yeah. uh, unfortunately true in, in some cases today. Uh, thanks for uh, spending the time with us. 
And um, on behalf of the Future Lab AI for EO, thanks again. Bye bye to everybody. Or are there any administrative things, Daniela? No, 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 on my side. Okay, so. Um, I'm so sorry, here is David. I have again one more question, um, <laughs> and I want to hear your opinion, Johan. Or I just saw a video um, about the Tesla autopilot um, on LinkedIn. Um, and there they said kind of they've trained their autopilot with like 70,000 hours of GPU um, data. Um, and it seemed like that it's also like very powerful. So it seems like an in industry like people using neural network very um, kind of effectively. Um, can you comment on that? What do you think? about that uh it, it they're definitely kind of neural networks are uh used in many applications these people spend lots of uh hours and with kind of huge amounts of gpus and uh, computing power to do the training uh there is a lot of effort going into developing uh good training sets and pretty much especially for these car companies, these kind of training sets are their uh, crown jewels. So they don't hand those out. They don't publish anything. They keep it close, tightly close. But on the other hand, you have to say, obviously Tesla didn't train the neural network on having a big white truck cross uh, the lane. You know, there was a, a fatal accident where the, um, where the Tesla autopilot mis, mistook uh, a, a truck, which a white truck, a white big truck, which crossed the the street, for a billboard, and so it didn't break. Okay, so there would be then more, even like more testing and more training than. Yeah, like I, I, I think in probably most applications you really need to continue training and also continuously really do a good evaluations on the on the training set. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Okay, so I think we have a last question. <laughs> yeah. From, uh, I think it's also um, maybe a good question to conclude on Johan, uh, you talked a lot about what are the problems with um, using AI? Uh, can you talk about what is the motivation to use AI or neural networks in aviation in the first place? Uh, what is so good about it, or what advantages do you see in using these algorithms? Why can't we I just think, use I them? I think for for the for the kind of aviation, I think uh, or, uh, with kind of more and more autonomous functions, especially for kind of drones, uh, just just look at the possible kind of applications: surveying, uh, precision agriculture. All they all need a lot of autonomy functionality and I think AI, if used properly, can help to uh, reach this level of autonomy. Thank you. So I think we can close the session. Thank you again, Pro Professor Schumann, for this very nice and interesting presentation. We all enjoyed the session and thanks to the audience for being in this seminar. Have a nice thank day. Thank you very much for inviting me and for the uh, uh, good, good discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.